Rob, give us give us your intro. My name is Rob Small, and uh, I am classed as a burn survivor, although it's not really a title that I enjoy. A burn's a uh, endurer, or I, know, I was passive to survive. Sounds like I chose, but you know, I think I was more there for the ride. And the last twenty years, I've lived abroad in the most amazing locations in the world: the Maldives, the Cook Islands, Samoa, and now uh, sitting in sunny London. Uh, waiting for the the next adventure. We're lucky enough to do quite a few adventures. So uh, yeah, the next one is is always the most exciting. That's what you always say anyway. Doesn't matter what you do, the next one is the most exciting because it's something new. Definitely, definitely. And um, so give us an idea of some of the adventures that you'd been on before, like you know, sort of where where you'd been on the lead up. Um, the lead up, apart from the fire, which was you know the biggest adventure. It's weird because it doesn't matter what I do. I'm 42 now, and the fire was when I was 30, and uh, it always reverts back to it. It doesn't matter which way the conversation goes, it's weird, it comes back to it, but um, I, I climbed um, uh, mountain Mount uh, Ranjani in, in Indonesia, that was kind of cool, that was one of my first tastes of, of doing something a bit different, going on holiday and decided to do a little mountain, it's not a big peak, what is it, three and a half thousand meters or something, but you know, it's a few days up and a few days down and a bit of fun in between. I've been around active volcanoes, which is, is kind of cool, which I'm going to go and do in Iceland as well, which I'm a bit excited about, but Edna a few times, been around there and had a little play. Um, Norway, which was more training expeditions for the South Pole, but is still, you know, sitting in a tent in minus 30, trying to get your stove to light uh, and can't work out that you didn't prime it properly as the frustration grows and the gloves have to come off to do it. And, and that's quite fun. And then just, you know, the, probably one of the biggest adventures, my, my son, but any, any father is going to say that, you know, anybody with a, as you know, anybody with a kid, you know, it surprises you every day, but physical stuff, you know, overcoming and, and learning to walk again and, and all of that, that was something that I think everybody takes for granted that they can walk because we do, there's no thought process, you stand up and you walk and to not be able to just stand up and walk and have to think and being told how to use your foot and your muscle. That was by far the largest adventure I'd overcome. And it took the best part of three, three and a half years to do it. So now I can walk with that limp. And if I'm fully clothed, no one really knows that I've had the injuries, which is, it's like my, my disguise. Yeah, I think, you, you know, it's, it's, we definitely, we jump onto that now, to be honest, because you sort of mentioned in it. So, you know, if you give us a rundown, I suppose, you know, of, of kind of the events that sort of led to it, you know, what, what was the adventure you were on and, you know, take us through what you remember, if you're happy to do that. Yeah. So I, uh, my, my, my official job would be, a, I guess, a scuba diving instructor. So I left sunny Scotland when I was uh, 20 and I moved to the Maldives and I was there for five years, I think it was. And then the Cook Islands and basically I rattle off all these wonderful places. And the next contract at that point in 2009, was Zanzibar, a little tiny island in, in Africa. And uh, it was great. It's exactly how you'd think it would be. Beautiful beaches, a lot of fun. Um, but there was no power to the island at the time. And uh, the power to my house was a small petrol generator um, because the main line had gone. And that blew up one night with me in the house. So the decision, you think that you're going to be really calm and and in control because of training you've done and so on. It doesn't really work like that. I remember going to get a towel because the fire was in the doorway. I was blown into the house. And at that point, that just a normal sized door was just on fire. I thought, I've got this really big house behind me. No problem. All I'm gonna do, is run to the bathroom. I'm gonna wet a towel. I'm gonna come back and kind of put it over my head and just walk through nice and calm. <laughs> I got the towel. It only took one and a half minutes. I came back and it was it, it makes a noise that the fire growls at you. Africa's very dry and windy, so the perfect uh, environment for this fire to spread. And I couldn't even see the door anymore, and the flames were blowing through the windows and everywhere I looked, there was just flames everywhere. The door, the front door behind me was locked, I didn't have the key. And it's a big solid oak door security is a big deal. And all the windows have bars on them for security in Africa, so I couldn't get out a window. So my first thought was to hide in the back room. I was gonna go and hide in, in my bedroom, which was quite far away until, until the fire brigade came, I'd be fine. And then something a split second was, get out, just, just go. 
Now, all of this I've just spoke about is maybe one minute. In my, this whole timing was maybe three, four seconds this all happened in, from getting the towel to decisions and thinking. So I did the same. I put the towel over my head and took a deep breath. And I'm thinking, Bunsen burner, remember you were in school? You used to light it and put your hand through it and nothing happened. I thought the same thing. That's why I've got no scars on my face because of the towel. Uh, but when I ran through the door, what I didn't know was that, that little small petrol generator that was powering the house that blew up, all the excess petrol that was in it had splattered on the floor. And I had a tiled floor at the back there. So when I ran through the tiles, I was splashing in the petrol and it set me on fire. So as I ran through it, I, I, I remember looking down and I remember shouting, Darren, who's the guy that was there? I goes, I think there's a bit of a problem. And I was on fire flames everywhere I remember seeing it you couldn't feel anything there was no burning there was no pain but I could see I was on fire and I ran across and the gardener had been that day and there was a, a bunch of leaves in the corner and I don't know why but I thought if I jump up and hit the leaves the impact will, will put the fire out so I jumped up a span in the air there's a, there's a good picture we've got a picture of the leaves actually and I landed in the leaves and all I did was set the leaves on fire <laughs> some coarse dry leaves and I could have put out the flame so I, I stood up and I, I took uh, five steps or so forward and then I sat down and this is the bit that I'm not sure what happened because I wasn't out I wasn't in pain but I don't know why I sat down and I was still on fire my back here was was in flames I remember that and I, I kind of crouched down and then Darren kicked in and he's the one that put out the rest of the fire on my back. And that's why I've got quite thick scarring, this one here, and it coincides with sitting on my back. But it always bothers me and it still bothers me because I don't know. Do I sit down to give up? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, then, you know, the, the hospital treatment and, and, and everything that followed and the attempt to get back to, to London was a whole a whole drama story in itself. And it's, you know, I can go into it straight away if you want, but I, I'm, I don't want to take up all your time of just listening to me ramble on. We can go bit by bit or I can keep going, whatever you want to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that, um, you know, anybody that would be, that would listen would, would be interested in hearing the kind of story because so far, you know, it sounds like an unbelievable experience and to, you know, have the mentality and be able to tell it the way that you are, you know, still is impressive. So yeah, you know, take us through, sort of what happened in the hospital um, sort of thereafter, or actually, you know, you, you're obviously sat down at this point, you've had the fire put out and then, um, you know, sort of, you know, what's going on after that. That's when the pain, the first pain I was aware of kind of came after that. And it was just heat. It wasn't pain. It was heat. I felt heat. I knew where I was. I, I knew I didn't switch off. I knew everything that was going on, but I never knew the extent of my injury. I looked down at my legs and my legs were pure white, the perfect paper white. And they're swollen up to maybe two, three times the size they are. Bearing in mind that I've lived in hot countries at that point for the last 10 years. Nice tan, you know, quite toned, quite happy with how my body was. I had this white puffed up leg, pure white, pure smooth. And around my ankles was my skin. It's hanging. Imagine it dripped off. Imagine that I, you had a white candle and it was completely pure. But at the bottom, there was some brown wax that had fallen away. That's my leg, both of them. And I looked down and I thought, oh, thank goodness, all that's happened is, you know, I burnt my suntan off, you know, I'll be fine. I, I didn't know what that meant. I truly mm. believed I was fine. And oh, all that's happened is, you know, my hair's blown off my legs and the suntan's burnt away. What that actually means is I was burnt straight through all the nerves, everything. It was full thickness burn all the way. So what you end up seeing in the movies of these people's legs decomposing and black, and that's how they were going to go, as, as I later found out. So at that point, I'm in a, a porch, um, a, a driveway, which is the size of, it was big, maybe f you could fit um, four or five cars. So it, it, it was quite large driveway and, and gravel. But when I came to the house, because I was only running in quickly to get uh, a couple of bits, we were going to a party that night. I parked the car in front of the gate, my car, and my keys were inside the burning building. So no one could get the car to get me and no one could open the gate to get out. So they, they managed to get the gate down. But you know, one of these things that if you're in pain, let's say you, I don't know, bro I've never broke a bone, I don't know, but if you broke your leg and someone tried to lift you up and it would be horrible pain, but you could kind of lift yourself up and, and manage it yourself. That was the kind of thing. They tried to carry me to a car 
but it was so painful I couldn't let them so I had to get there myself because I could manage the pain so I, I dragged myself stupidly in hindsight through the gravel so all that was happening is this soft white skin was getting gravel embedded into it really easy like imagine pushing a stone into a marshmallow hot marshmallow went in like it was nothing so now my legs from pure white was essentially stone embedded legs so we got to the car and there's no power in Zanzibar, remember, this is kind of why this happened. So the hospital's got no power. So there's no point in taking me to hospital because they can't do anything. But there's a chamber, there's a reconstruction chamber. And I know of it because my job is there as a diver and I know they've got morphine. So I get the guys, I eventually get in the car and we have to go to the, the hotel to get petrol, which is 10 minutes up the road first to make sure we can make it to the chamber. And on the way there, you know, there's a bit of panic. We get there and I say, get petrol, but get water, get lots of bottles of water. And they came back with, you know, the little tiny bottles, two of them. I said, no, 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 get as much as you can carry big ones. And what this was is what I was feeling was burning. So while we were driving down, I said to them, well, I say, do you, you do it. So I say, I say, now I want you to count to three and pour water where I tell you. Okay, left arm, right arm, back, head, left leg, left arm. And all they were doing was cooling they were managing my pain because they didn't know where the chamber was. So I had to direct them in this condition, in the dark with no power, with them telling me left leg, right leg, head, left foot, right 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 foot leg. And, and we ran out of water. So we get to the chamber and uh, the operator was a Swiss guy from memory and his nurse. And they carried me in and they loaded me up with morphine and they, they picked the stones out of my legs because that's all they could do. Um, there was no way to get to the mainland, no power, no flights. And I called my parents that night because I knew they'd find out. And I told my mum that, oh, you might find out. I've, I've been in an accident. I broke my hands a little bit. I'm absolutely fine. But in case you find out, that's what it is. So they had no idea what had happened. Um, the next day, I was flown Medivac, so just a plane, to Dar es Salaam. Um, not in a good way, but I wasn't, you know, I was quite coherent and I knew what was going on and I didn't realise I was as bad as I was. But when I got there, they, they wanted money to admit me to the hospital. And I just lost everything in a fire. I had no access to anything. Um, but my wallet, which I still have today, was in my pocket and it, it, uh, it wasn't set on fire. So I had my cards and they physically turned their back on me. They, imagine a desk, hello, reception at the hospital, you know, I get carried in. And uh, they, they turned the back, they physically turned the back. And then we made a deal that every day they would be paid 250 US dollars because that's the maximum that my card could take out of the machine. Mm. And they would keep me. So Darren, the same guy, took my card, went to the closest bank, took out 250, and then they admitted me into this room. It's a private room. Um, uh, imagine something resembling a bus shelter with a bed in it and it's on toilet um and that, that was about it. all the staff in the hospital they wear ripped tops and flip-flops jandals i've been aware i don't know what you call them flip-flops jandals or thongs one of those versions of the same footwear and they're all ragged and you know not judging them but from the hospitals that we're used to it, it felt weird and i get into this bed and i get on the bed sheets uh, and they'd stick to my my open wounds everywhere and one of the first things that you're meant to do with a, with a big burn like I had is fluids, okay? Your skin uh, keeps everything in, including the fluids. So I'd lost a lot of fluids. Uh, I had no IVs. They gave me no fluids and almost zero painkillers and some paracetamol. I wasn't given anything. So this bed sheets would stick to me, my whole body. So my, my burns are my knees all the way down, my back, all my arms, the sides. So I'd lie in bed, relief. But the treatment, <clears throat> the treatment was that I was to be taken to a bathtub at some point in the day and they'd scrub me with a nail brush, an actual, you don't see them anymore, but it's a nail, it's a nail brush, like when you were a kid. Yeah, yeah. So you sort of cleaning your nails out a little bit. Yeah, those ones. yeah, yeah. that's what we used. But in order to get there, I had to go from this rigid lying down position. I had to sit up in the bed and bend, which I couldn't do because everything was burnt away gone or seized and they had to pull this bed sheets off from me it's stuck on so when you get a scab and you put 
gauze or something on it sticks and you pull it off and it pulls the scab off with you as well. My whole body was that. So when they pulled it off, all that happened is my whole body became an open wound that I'd then forced into a wheelchair. I'd be wheeled through. They'd lift me and put me into this warm bath, which open wounds in hot water hurts. Salt water it was. And they salted as well, did you say? Salted water. Salt, salt water. Yeah, it, it's, it wasn't to hurt. It's the salted uh, salt yeah, yeah. water. Uh, it's good for wounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's going to sting a lot more, isn't it? So yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't fun. And they yeah. scrub, they scrub all my wounds, my legs, and I'd scream. And I, I mean, scream. It sounded like I was probably being tortured. I feel sorry for all the other people there. They didn't know what was going on. And then I'd be taken out, put back into this wheelchair, then flat into the bed. It's my favourite part of the day because I knew at that point it was twenty-four hours roughly until that would happen again. I don't ever remember going to the toilet, which is weird. And I don't ever remember eating at all. I, I must have, but no recollection of it. Uh, and I was there for just under 10 days. I was told I didn't need any operations. I'd heal on my own. To date, I've had, I think it's 35, 34, 35 operations so far. If I'd gone straight to uh, a London hospital when it happened, I would still need surgery, but I probably would have been a lot better way than I was. The mass infection that set in from being in that environment was quite, you know, evasive in my body. Um, and the first time I saw a surgeon was about six days in. And um, yeah, he, he wasn't very nice. Um, he was laughing slightly, which might have been his way to try and calm me down or um, I didn't come across well. And again, he, was, he said, you're the one that's going to make me the money, is what he said. I was Those are his, his, his exact words exact when he came words. in. You're the one who's going to make me the money. You're the one who's going to make me the money. So I don't know if it, he might have been saying it as a joke. It might have been trying to, you know, bedside humor, trying to ease it. I just remember being told I didn't need the surgery to him being there to the, the nurses who'd always say, oh, Polly, Polly Sana, Polly, which in Swahili, you know, oh, sorry, poor you. Oh, I hate that word. Um, no offense to them, I just it's it's a trigger for me. Yeah, cling yeah, of course. Film. Haven't gone through all of that. The smell of cellphine cling film. Mm. They use that to wrap your wounds in the hospital, and the, it, it's it's completely a complete barrier in between mm. surgeries and so on. So I was wrapped up in lots of cling film, but the smell of it triggers me. It takes me straight back to the hospital. So when I wrap up food, chicken after cooking, you know, I like cooking, I get that smell instantly in the hospital every time. It's kind of weird, but um. Uh, we tried to get help, and I don't know why, because I didn't do any of the phone calls or meetings at all, but we were told there was no help. No no one was helping. There was no many about flight. There was, I don't know why, there was nothing. And it sounds dramatic, but this is absolute true. I said to Darren, I'm going to die. We need to get out any way we can. I'm going to die here. Um, and then my old boss, um, we tried to book a flight, and I was... I was on the no fly list. I, I was dead in arrival. So um, they, I wasn't going to make the flight. So no so one would take me. What, what was the pro? So you'd already tried to get onto some flights and told them that you were injured and then they put you on a no fly list. We called them the first time and said what happened and I need to get back. And they, they refused my flights. These airlines refused my flights and they said I, I couldn't get out. I, I couldn't fly in that condition. I wasn't stable. Um, so then we booked a couple of first class tickets. Um, with a first class ticket, you get perks. Um, and some of the perks being that you can rock up to the, the airport an hour before the flight and walk through and everything. And that's what we did. So I was carried out in a bed sheet. The best line is coming up. The best one is coming. So you booked, you booked these flights, just to clarify, you booked these flights yeah. without telling them who you were, basically? Yes, pretty much. Um, we needed, uh, uh, that's weird because... I don't know, if, this is back then where when you give a credit card, they had the, they had the machine. So I don't know if their airport system was a bit, a bit outdated because anybody who, who books a flight, you still have to give your name. Mm. No, that's it. We, we did, we, we used a fake name. That was it. They didn't ask for passport numbers. We just used, you know, Joe Jefferson name. It didn't matter. It was mm. a, you know, five grand booking one way or whatever it was. Um, and we turned up and that's what, then we changed the names. That's exactly what it was. And we got there and we said, ah, it's actually us. This is their real names and details. And they said, no. Um, and I said the words almost identical. Um, if you don't allow a British citizen 
a chance to get to Britain and I die here, then my friends will tell everyone what happened. Um, and it went, it was British Airways that took me in the end, and it went to the actual pilot who had the decision whether to, to take me or not. Uh, and he, well, he said, yes, of course. Mm. But the bit, there's, there's a great bit coming <coughs> before this. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been to the gym this morning. I'm not used to it so much now. Uh, I was carried out of the hospital on a bed sheet because I couldn't put any clothes on. I was 10 days in, nine days in, and I was rigid. My wounds were black like, uh, like coal, like you see in the movies, how my body was looking. Completely naked, four guys with a corner of a bed sheet each. We get to the airport and my phone rings at the hospital. Yes, yeah. So they gave me a bag of pills, paracetamols for the, for the trip. Um, they were calling and asking for the bed sheet back. <laughs> no. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All back to the bed sheet. You'd already yeah. given them several days worth of $250 just to keep you there. And then, yeah, they were just keeping me there for the money, for sure. Um, so we get on the flight, completely naked, apart from a bed sheet. And one of the security guys at the airport, I love him. I, I wish I knew his name and who he was. He gave me his t-shirt, a t-shirt covering my uh, modesty and a, a, a white um, hospital sheet that I was stuck to that I wasn't willing to rip me off again. And I lay there and the, the chief um, air steward or I think the purser is the proper term of the flight. She sat with me pretty much the whole flight and they were all told that I wouldn't make the flight. I, I would. I was dead in arrival. I would not survive this flight. It's not possible. And uh, I was in and out of consciousness all the way through. And when we landed and I was still alive and I think they were surprised and I was still um, surprised. Um, I don't remember anything of the flight really. Um, the next thing I remember was the ambulance crew coming onto the aircraft. And uh, I remember him with his, you know, I just came from a place where they had flip flops and raggedy shirts was the nurses. And all of a sudden this guy's, hello. Well, these green uniform with the ironed in bits and the NHS badge. And I, I gave up at that point, as in, I felt I had to control every aspect of the situation. I had to make sure I was in the hospital. I had to make sure that we got on the plane. I had to direct us to, you know, the chamber at the beginning and make sure I had to still have control or best that I could. And the first time that I felt I don't have to do that anymore because this guy in green knows what he's doing and I don't have to worry about it. And then, then it gets hazy for a month or two. I was put in a coma and I was giving gas and air and took out the plane, no passport control, which I think is kind of cool. I like that, weirdly. <laughs> and got in the ambulance and I asked him if he put the lights on because I was nerd at heart, you know, oh, put the siren on, that would be cool. And he goes, absolutely, blues and twos. So we went to Hillingdon. It's brilliant uh, that you had a sense of humour even at this point in time. You know, you'd been for all of that carnage and you, yeah, you're I, still there with a sense of humour asking I, them to I, put the blues and twos on. I wanted the lights, yes. And I was, I was meant to be flying to Aberdeen, so a bit of mist. Um, my mum and dad still thought that I'd burnt my hands um, and I was meant to fly through to Aberdeen. So uh, it would have been Dar to Ethiopia, Ethiopia to London, London, connect to Aberdeen. And when I got to London, they said, I don't know who you're kidding. No, take the hospital here. But my mum and dad thought that uh, I was still coming. And I remember calling them before I got on the plane saying, do you think you can have an ambulance waiting for me in Aberdeen? And they didn't understand. You broke your hands. We can't do that. What are you talking about? So then I was in the ambulance going to Hillingdon. And I, I said to the guy, uh, I've got to go to Aberdeen. If I can't fly, can you take me in the ambulance? And he said, if they allow us, that's what you want, it's okay. And he said, I remember him saying, it would be my honour, I'd take you up. And that was always the plan. Mum and dad had still no idea. Got to Hillingdon, and I remember being taken in, and just really quickly, everybody was on me. Somebody sitting there, and someone here, and there was tubes going in my neck, and up my nose, and putting the catheter in, wasn't fun, <laughs> semi-conscious. And they were prepping me to go to Chelsea Westminster, back in the ambulance to, to Chelsea Westminster. I think I got there, it must have been somewhere around two, three in the morning. And then my surgeon, Jorge, my hero, I love him, I absolutely love him, was waiting for me downstairs. And they take you in and they go on the left and the burn units on the top floor. 
I remember him. I'm obviously lying down in the, the, the gurney and that. And he was right here. He looks like you, actually. Bold Spanish guy with thick black glasses. Lovely man. And he was stroking my head, asking what had happened. And I was kind of telling him, and he told me I was safe and it was all okay. And I was taken up. And I remember a barrage of people. It felt like there was a hundred people in that room. Realistically, there was probably five or six. And they were all everywhere. And they kept calling me Robert, which was weird because my nickname, strangely, is Gaz. It's gone since the fire, but I was always Gaz. Very few people knew me as Robert. I was wondering, who's this Robert person? Who, I'm Gaz, what are they talking about? And then they put me in a coma um, and I, I woke up somewhere in March, I think it was, um, with a beard and a bald head and tubes everywhere again, mass hallucinations. And I was mummified, there's a cool picture, mm. got a good picture of it, completely mummified bandages all the way through, bald, beard, you know, the drunk yeah, yeah, yeah. The smile on my face with tubes up my nose. And you say you were hallucinating? Mass hallucinations. I've been, I've been amazing places. I've been to America. I was in a, the two big ones, I was in an aircraft hangar in Cuba with my mum. And the worst one was, uh, I was in a, a caravan in America. And all of these places, everyone was trying to kill me. They were trying to inject me with stuff. They like, mum, don't leave me. They're trying to kill me. I was I out loud. So the reality that I was seeing was doctors and nurses injecting me with things. And my mind was making up that they're killing me. And, um, you know, I was screaming to my mom, asking her, don't leave. And I couldn't work out why she was allowed to leave the hangar in Cuba. But I had to stay. How can you can leave? And I have to stay and they've got to kill me. And I remember the first time that I realized it was a hallucination. I was going down for an operation. And one of the porters and the anesthesiologist was taking me down and I was speaking. And all of a sudden, I remember seeing the hospital and I knew I was in a hospital. I knew it. Oh, I'm going, going for surgery. And then I was in a hangar again. And I'm, my first thought was, well, I'm going to swear here, I'm sorry, but this is what yeah. I Yes, man. Oh, I, fucking hell, I've survived this whole fire and now I've gone insane. And that's what I thought. I thought I survived all this to go insane. I generally thought I'd lost my mind and I was petrified. And then I, I don't know. I started getting better and probably the drugs was less. They give you a drug to make you forget on purpose. I can't remember what it's called, but it, it's a cocktail of stuff because you don't want to remember all the stuff they were doing. So it's a bit hazy until end of March, April. And then the day I asked them to shave me, supposedly it was a big day because it, it's, it shows you where you are mentally. And then all the rehab started and then the, all the setbacks of my legs. And I remember the nurse telling me uh, Sylvia is her name. I love Sylvia. That yeah, the, the mess. What happened? I, I kind of said, you know, what happened? And um, she was crying. She was upset while she was telling me about my legs. And I almost lost. I think there was a conversation to take off my left leg. So when they, when they're looking for live skin, they just imagine a grater, and they're taking away all of the dead skin, and they keep going until it bleeds. When it bleeds, it's alive. So on my left leg, they were taking away all of these layers. It's my, my left leg is almost half the size of my right one and it wouldn't bleed. So I was almost at the end where they thought they might lose the leg and all of a sudden they got blood. I think it was a, I think the big operation was, I think it was 18 hours or something, two surgeons, two surgeons for 18 hours, one in each leg. And yeah, I'm alive. I mean, and that's that, that, that story, very long winded, I'm so sorry. Um, Minus a couple of little bits here and there, and some of the little bits that I missed are actually really funny, um, gets me to the point of decision. B. Burns guy, at, at that point, 29 years old, and give up, or go, fuck it, fuck it, just, just keep going. And I chose keep going, but I was passive. I'm alive because of the doctors and nurses and administrators and ambulance and air crew and everybody I'm alive because of them. I'm walking because of them and partly me. I was very passive in everything it did. It's, it's not that I'm superhuman and I did this amazing thing. I was just lucky to have amazing people who, who gave enough of a shit about me not to give up. Very lucky, man. Very lucky.
I think, you know, there, there is that aspect of it and there are a lot of people that want to help you. And equally, there is the fact that, you know, because you you would have paid a huge part in that, you know, and, and having the mentality to push past it and also to accept the help to such a high level. Because, you know, I don't know if that's something that you see sometimes that people aren't always uh, as accepting as they could be to get to where you've now managed to get to, um, to be able to keep doing your adventures. I think at that point, to accept the help, it was... Uh, I had no choice because I couldn't help myself. I mean, another bit I missed, my parents, they didn't know any of this had happened. The first thing they knew was the flight didn't come in. No, it wasn't the flight. They got a call before we were meant to go to the airport from Jorge, my surgeon, said, you need to come to London. And they were like, well, why? And uh, I wasn't going to last the night. I was, I've been, they were told, excuse me, they were told quite a few weeks every night that, I don't think he's going to make it through the night. I think this might be his last night. What chance of survival did they give you? 27%. 27. How you wonder how they come up with those numbers, isn't it? You know, I know exactly how they come up with them. <laughs> so you take your age, they take the size of your burn, and it's a multiple there. So the size of full thickness burn I had was 43, uh, and I was 29 years old. And there's a multiple there somewhere. I was 30 years old. My birthday was while I was in hospital. So the multiple's there. So 70, but 73%. So that's a 27% chance of living. So that, that's how it, that's kind of, I mean, it's a very overly simplified version, but that is the multiple. Um, and so I lived partly because of my job. My lung capacity was very high because I'm a diving instructor. Um, so that, that helped me for sure, I think. But it was the diseases that I was carrying. I mean, they all came in with the full kits. They had to burn all the stuff. I was in a private room for the whole trip, my whole six and a half months in hospital, wherever it was, six months, um, was in a private room. And one side of that is amazing. Everyone wants a private room. But six months on my own in a room when other people have got people to talk to all day, no one to talk to. My family couldn't stay in London because they're from Aberdeen. So I was on my own all day with no one around and the nurses became really close to me and, and the doctors as well. And so I got to know them pretty well, but there was, I, I didn't know anyone. My family, of course, at the beginning were told I was going to die and they had to come down and a bit strenuous. So it was very, to accept help was easy at that point because I, I had no choice without it. I was gone mm -hmm. to accept help later on when I, when I was better enough to, to be walking and, and go, well, walking's not enough i want to now climb stuff or run stuff or cycle stuff or <laughs> the first time diving after the accident was quite nerve-wracking and funny um and i had to accept i had limitations that my body wasn't the same as it was and i found that hard and i wouldn't let people help me all the time because i need to do bits i had to have a full hip replacement on my right side so that that impacted things and i found that hard to to realize that my limitations were, I had them. No, not that I, I found it hard to realize I had limitations. Um, Cause you know, at that point, as we all know, young and indestructible, mm. you could say I was, cause you know, I made it. So I was indestructible. To some degree. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, so, um, you know, obviously having the limitations there and they sort of mentioned that, what, what did they say to you when you'd sort of finished up and you, before you perhaps started you know, getting better and starting to recover and walk and stuff like that, you know, what did they say that you wouldn't be able to do again, that you actually have managed to, I mean, my, to my, do my walk, I had to learn to walk again. So it wasn't so much that I couldn't walk again. It was just, you have to relearn it. Like we take it for granted. It's, it's not easy. It's, you know, there's no thought process to walk. I had to have a thought process. And when I tried to engage that thought process, I couldn't remember how to do it. And it really hurt. I mean, really hurt. Supposedly coming, a burn injury is the most painful thing that you can heal from, supposedly. I, I stubbed my toe the other day and I swear that's the most painful thing I've ever had in my life. So I'm not sure, but uh, the, being told that I couldn't go in the sun, that was a big one. I, I can't go in the sun ever for the rest of my life. Somebody who just lives in 30 degree countries for the last 10 years. I found that hard that I, I have to, to cream every day, nonstop moisture management and pressure garments. And, Still now? 
um, I'm meant to. I, I'm not the best advocate for that because of how I chose to, to live. I'll get onto that as well, actually. <laughs> um, and I, so when I was told that I can't go in the sun, my first day out of hospital, I went and got sunburn on purpose. I did it on purpose. I went and got sunburn because it didn't make sense that I knew what they were saying was by the book and made sense, but I have to live with it for the rest of my life. I can't live the rest of my life hiding from the sun. I need to know what happens. Is it dangerous? Is it going to kill me? Turns out I go red, like I always did. I go very slightly brown for half a day to look at my tan, and I go back to white. It's exactly the same. I need to know that. So the list of things that they said that you can't or shouldn't do versus what you can and do do are, are very different. Don't run. Don't play football. I play football. I run, but very weirdly. Cycling is good. Cycling is a thing I can do well, and it was something that I was told I could do. Um, basically, anything they said I couldn't do, I, I, I gave a go just to find out if it was true or not, if that makes sense. And now there's so things that they said. So the South Pole expedition, when, when that came up in that attempt, there's quite a lot of people who say that someone in my condition, my legs, that, that environment is not possible for me. And there's some doctors who think it is, and there's some doctors who think it absolutely isn't. Well, until we go and do it, we've got to prove one of the groups wrong. So it's it's how some of the things kind of come about. It's, well, I don't know if I can do it. So let's go and find out. And this cycle, I'm pretty convinced I can do it. This this the, the, the Iceland trip that's coming up, it's going to be about 2,000 kilometres, give or take. Mm. Cycling, what, eight hours a day with all the kit, wind, rain. I'm yeah, pretty so sure yeah i mean the thing is a big part of it is always mentality but you know we sort of um we'll go on to that so if, if you're sort of saying about this trip you know you, you've been through all of this you know you've been told you're not going to be able to achieve or do certain things you know and and you're just basically saying now nah, balls to that i'm going to go and do it um you know and you've now got this new adventure plan tell us you know tell us about that and you know the sort of motivations for it and and you know so when when it's going to go forward so the, the I mean, there's always lots of trips in the pipeline. I think anybody's always got ideas. And for years, I had ideas. It was just work always got in the way. There was always another contract. Oh, I'll, I'll do that after I've done this. And it gets pushed and pushed and pushed. And then when you have the accident, you realise you don't want to push too much because, you know, there's going to be a point where you, you don't have it anymore. So there's you know, the South Pole. We got close to having full funding and that COVID scuppered that completely. But it's still there. I will do it one day. Kilimanjaro is another big one that I really want to do because it's the country of where the fire happened. Um, but the next one that will happen in August this year, so in three months-ish time, is um, Iceland. Uh, I'm looking I'm looking there because I've got a big map of Iceland right next to me with pins in it. I love putting pins in the map. Love it. Um, and we're going to cycle around Iceland, which is, um, I think, 1,642 kilometres if you were to take the ring road. Um, we're visiting some glaciers and, and doing a couple of bits and bobs, um, which adds another roughly 500 or so on. So it is about a 2,000 kilometre trip, um, which is filmed um, uh, uh, a story, a documentary by Kevin of New Earth Films um, for Dolby, it is actually. Um, and basically, it's a story of well, if I can do stuff like this, imagine what you can do. It's not just me who's been told that they shouldn't or can't do things after injury. I, I reckon almost anybody who goes through a hospital or a doctor's office with a, a major injury of some sort, a car crash, a physical injury, or even diabetes or anything, I think there's always a list of stuff that you can't do anymore. And I think uh, I, I think there's a shame because it scares people into never giving it a try. So I think some people are dumb enough. I'm done so, because I'm putting myself in potential harm's way, but I, I got to find out. And at the same time, maybe we can find out for other people as well. Because if they see that, oh, that guy can do it. So God, I can definitely do this. And it doesn't have to be that somebody wants to copy, you know, the same things that I or other people might do. I don't particularly think this is a major strenuous trip. Maybe for someone with the legs of my condition, it might be a bit more, but it, you know, a, a trip can be anything. It can be a walk around Richmond Park. It's a big park for some people. That's a big trip. You know, if it's a physical disorder they have, it's a mental um, uh, issue they have, that Richmond Park is enough of an expedition that you think that you, you can't do it because you've been told that it's going to be too hard for you. 
the size of trips are relevant. It's just the mentality to know that you can give it a go. And if you fail, it doesn't matter because it's about giving it a go. It's about having the mental toughness and the, and the belief to, to start. The belief to start is the thing. If your start lasts an hour, then okay, and then you lasted an hour. Next time you might get to two hours. When I was learning to walk again, I did it in um, Hyde Park. And at that point I was staying in, in Notting Hill. It sounds very posh, but it really wasn't. Uh, and I had about half an hour of walking ability every single day. And that's it. It was like a timer. And I had to get to a shop to get lunch and back. And then I'd sleep for most of the day. And I'd use markings in the pot. How far today I managed to go for 31 minutes and I got to the corner where the uh, um, uh, fountain is before I had to turn back or I'd run out of power. And, you know, every day I'd do maybe three or four more steps. It's the same thing, you know, Richmond Park for an hour, next time it's an hour and a half. The most important thing is start, not to finish, in my opinion. Mm. You got well, This is it. You've got to find out what your limits are and, and sort of how you get there. And it's all around you know what an adventure is for you because what your adventure is is not the same as somebody else's adventure and i think like you know you're sort of saying the key message there you know is is that you can do a lot more than you think you can do in these situations so it's good to get going and find out just how far you can go not only that you know it doesn't have to be some grand adventure to to mean anything a lot of people say and they use the word, oh, I'm only doing this. And I think I maybe said it earlier. It's only a cycle around it because sometimes you feel, oh, well, it's not a South Pole trip. I'm not climbing Everest. I feel like you have to justify that it's not such a big thing. There is no only uh, anything out of your comfort zone. If your comfort zone in getting out of that is to sit on the bus to Kingston because that makes you nervous and you do it, <laughs> celebration. That's huge. It doesn't have to be physically strenuous. It's getting out of that comfort zone and having the, the courage to start, to try. I think it's, there's no, it's only, that's, that's a terrible term. But that comes from embarrassment or feeling of, of um, not being good enough, not living up to, to these big names around. And I feel it as well sometimes. Hence why I said it's only a cycle around Iceland. I feel it as well. You're not living up to these, these big names. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think that that's, that's an awesome point that you've touched on there because, I, you know, it's one of those things where what's easy for some is not so easy for others. And, and actually, the fact that, you know, if someone finds, even like you say, getting on a bus very difficult, that concern, that nervousness, uh, that apprehension, if you can overcome that, for you, that's just as much of an achievement as it would be for someone that did perhaps climb Everest because that was their comfort zone that they pushed towards. Absolutely, exactly it, exactly it. And if you can get the mental place that you sit in the bus on your way to, I use Kingston because it's around the corner for me, um, and you, you get off the next stop, you started, it's a start. Maybe the next time you get two stops, start, just start. That's all it is. It's a really easy to talk about what you're gonna do as well. It's the best part of a trip, when it's really far away and the hardship's far away, and you get to go, oh, we're going to go and climb Everest on a pogo stick. And I'm going to do it in Bermuda shorts for that time of year. And I love at that point where it's just a talk because it's not real. That's the exciting part. And then when you get closer and the realism comes, the nerves come and it, the, the expectancy from other people because you've told them about it. I like that. I like the whole, I love planning trips. I love planning them almost as much as doing them, to be honest, which is weird. A lot of people hate it. The build up, the anticipation, it can be yeah. very exciting. Yeah, no, so I'm sure that uh, a lot of people can relate with that, you know, when you're sort of doing that adventure. So, you know, it's good. And, and I think that um, hearing and, and I'm sure that people, whoever listens and, and watches will sort of agree that there's a lot of inspiration there for people, not only people just, just every day, but, you know, people that have been through traumatic experiences or have, you know, been told that they can't achieve certain things. You know, it's good to hear from someone like yourself who went through such an, unbelievable experience it sounds you know like some truly awful thing to bring yourself through come out the other side still for one have a sense of humor is quite impressive and you know and and be able to push yourself to that point so that's really good and i mean you know sort of going on to this journey like how can people find out a little bit more about this journey and, and a bit about you so it, it's starting to the, the social media channels are starting to open now um the website is actually yesterday and um, being changed from the the South Pole one. So if they were to go to um, fromfartoice.org, 
um, it will be updated with the new um, plans um, right in this exact second. I think it's still the South Pole stuff that's there, but it is changing along with um, from Far to Ice on Instagram or Facebook or all the usual. If you type in the words from Far to Ice, we will pop up there and you can see um, my you know, slightly battered, ugly face talking a lot of rubbish a lot of the time on, on all of these little channels and but you get to see the behind the scenes bits and little bits we're doing which is which is kind of fun definitely well no doubt like i say we'll you know we'll pop all the links there as well um and i think you know because you're one of our champions you know someone that we're really really pleased to support we're really looking forward to you know seeing you get getting on, on with the adventure and and supporting you anyway that we can and you know for someone like yourself with incredibly sensitive skin uh, you know, it's, it's something that's quite important is, is the layers that you're wearing. Um, you know, so how have you found before we got introduced to one another, like, how was it trying to find something that you could put on that was comfortable and, you know, felt safe, if you like? Firstly, you know, thank you for, for, uh, stepping up and, and, and helping us out with this. And, you know, not everybody does, uh, I used to be able to buy everything off the shelf. I was that lucky guy. Suits, I was exactly that size. Shoes, oh, I like the look of that online. I'll get them. And socks, clothes, very easy. And that's when you have the scarring that I have. And something to, to say as well, everybody's, not everybody's, a lot of people's scarring feels different. Some people have really bad itches with their scars. Some people don't like how they touch. I think I maybe told you before, uh, maybe not today, but other time, um, it took me years, actual years, to get used to my legs touching each other. So when you go to bed at night and your legs touch in the night, I couldn't handle that feeling because the nerve damage to all my legs, it was, my left leg could recognize my right leg. You know when you you know that your both hands are touching? Well, my legs, I couldn't understand it. My brain would wake me up. So every time I touch my legs, and people can have that with the clothing as well. It feels weird. So when you can get clothing that, that, that's comfortable, and can work with you and the scars, you tend to buy lots of the same thing. <laughs> so that's what you do. You get lots of the same garment. And some things I can't wear anymore um, that I used to like. Other things I've had to go looking for specialized equipment where socks, <laughs> socks, my feet are a mess. Uh, and socks for me are a big deal because it's that barrier between the shoes that never fit properly and the heavily scarring on my on my feet. So to get a pair of socks that are not hot feeling, not cold feeling, soft, don't make my feet feel alien or supportive, it's very hard to find. And when you do find them, you want 10 pairs to make sure that you can't run out. Clothing on your top as well, with the scarring on my back, it's the same thing. To have something that touches the skin that doesn't, it doesn't make the skin feel like it's it's really hard to if you don't have the burns it's almost hard to explain sometimes when sometimes when some things touch it it doesn't feel like it's you you can't associate it being touched it's weird so when you get the right clothing touching the the scarring that doesn't hit that memory spot of well that doesn't feel right or you know that's quite nice that's that's a that's a game changer and then when you take that away from everyday clothing and put yourself in a situation of climbing a mountain or sitting a bus to Kingston or, or wherever you're out of your comfort zone, when you're mentally out of your comfort zone, you don't want to have to worry about what's on your physical body as well. You don't want two of those battles. You don't want the mental battle and worrying about, oh, my feet don't feel right. My socks are bad. My tops are not good. So to, to have that. And, and for me, Armadillo, uh, which is a, a brand for for adventure um, that I've ended up wearing all day every day when I'm not an adventure because it it it, it suits how my body is. My I don't have to worry about my body. That sounds really lame, does it? But it's absolutely true. I, when you when I'm wearing it, I don't have to worry about it. I can worry about the mental bit. It's it's a nice it's a nice thing to have. And, and for me, again, I keep going about the socks because my feet are heavily burnt. To have a pair of socks like that is, is lovely for me. Definitely. So, I mean, you know, clothes are important in general, but in particular, the way you're sort of saying it there is, you know, if you don't have something that you feel comfortable in, 
you've got the two battles going on where you've got the adventure that you've got to worry about and you're constantly, yeah. We can mitigate, because you, you can never get rid of the mental battle. There is never, ever, ever a possibility where you're doing anything and you're not thinking about it. It doesn't exist. If we go back to, once again, my bus to Kingston or Everest or South Pole or, or Iceland, the mental side, you can't appease because it's all the time. But the physical side, you can. You can get comfortable in what you're wearing. You can be assured that the clothing you're wearing is right for the environment because you know, because it, it says so on the tin or you've tested it or you believe in it. So that's trying to appease the, the physical part because we can. Because the mental part, we can only top up along the way and it will always change. But the physical bit, we can, we can be sure on that. You, you can wear the right things to be sure that you've ticked the, the physical box. And that's what this is doing for me now anyway. Good. No, that's, it's awesome to hear. And, and, you know, again, we're really pleased to support you and even more pleased to hear how well the clothes have gone for when you're wearing them and uh you know looking forward to seeing you test them out on your next adventure so it'd be really good um i'm wearing them to death you know they, they might be worn out by the time i get to go anywhere i've got to remember to take them off <laughs> no they're designed they last a long time they're good quality like i'm pretty much always wearing mine and i don't go on adventures so it's good someone can put them through the test um but you know rob it's, it's been really awesome speaking to you um you know learning about your experience there so thank you very much for sharing that is there anything that I didn't cover that you wanted to go over or, or perhaps anything that I should ask in regards to adventures or anything like that? Not at all, mate. You've covered pretty much all the bits that I can think of anyway. 